Welcome, esteemed guests and space enthusiasts. Today we're diving into the depths of space, the progress of satellite technology, and the value of its economy. But before we cross the event horizon, let's start a bit closer to home. You see, humanity has a fascinating history of sending, let's call them unique items into space. First up, we have Camilla, the rubber chicken. Yes, this celestial bird has actually seen the cosmos. But as much as we love Camilla, she's not exactly what we'd call mission-critical technology. Next, we have a famous corned beef sandwich smuggled aboard the space flight. Delicious, absolutely essential for improving life on Earth, Probably not. And here, one of the first electric production sports cars. While it's fun to imagine an astronaut doing laps around Sun and Mars in it with the roof off, it's not quite what we aim for in terms of space exploration. And yet, as we journey from whimsical to the impactful, we reveal a different kind of artifact. This is a heart of new space revolution. And hey, it's not a brick, but a CubeSat that embodies a shift towards accessible, scalable, and standardized use of satellite technology. But don't worry, you're not back in 2000s. And my opening show is not intended for an introduction to a CubeSat. We have something bigger to reveal today. This little fellow acts as a symbol of New Space 1.0, as we call it. The first wave of new space was all about breaking governmental monopoly and proving that space could be a domain for private investment and entrepreneurship. From satellite DIY kits for garage entrepreneurs to asteroid mining ventures, water-based propulsion systems, or space burials, we had it all and still have it in terms of market's excitement and ingenuity. There were two main bottlenecks though, funding available for those ideas and launch availability to validate them. The second wave, or New Space 2.0, saw a significant expansion of private capital across the space sector. It was a period of commercial empowerment, where for the first time commercial launches outnumbered governmental ones. This era was defined by the spread of innovation, new partnerships, market consolidation, and the rise of private satellite constellations. Traditional space agencies began adapting, shifting towards more commercial engagements reflecting a seismic shift in how we approach space operations. And all this while media kept counting shoeboxes, microwaves, and washing machines we had sent to space. And where are we heading next, you may ask? As we step into this uncharted territory, the new space sector faces its own set of unique challenges. Technical and reliability demands have surged, especially with government and defense sectors becoming increasingly involved. The stakes are higher and the margin for error slimmer. Moreover, we're on a cusp of the next phase of commercial constellation deployment. This isn't just about putting more satellites into orbit, it's about creating cohesive, functioning and reliable systems that can provide global services from internet coverage to Earth observation. On top of these challenges is a period of peak solar activity we're observing. Solar flares and geomagnetic storms pose a real threat to satellite operations, pushing our designs and materials to their limits. It's a stark reminder of the harsh environment we're operating in. Yet these challenges don't exist in a vacuum. They're set against a backdrop of global instability, geopolitical and climate crisis, all demanding quick and reliable advances in the space domain. We and other small sat manufacturers face increasing pressure in the context of these challenges. We need to keep up with the demand. We need to balance the pace of innovation and cost expectations with the need for reliability. A clash between new spaces drive for rapid development and old spaces meticulous standards. There's a growing gap between customer expectations and reality, fueled by the immaturity of new space industry itself. And that requires some preparation. So, welcome to New Space 3.0. <laughs> 
3.0. And Aravet looks beyond launch success and evolves technological capabilities to address mission longevity, performance, reliability, and interoperability. Where the industry delivers on the promise of satellite applications for speedy manufacturing at scale, while ensuring the utmost quality to improve time to space and time in space through satellite standardization. To better understand how this new era could change our industry, let's compare two different approaches for scaling a satellite constellation. The old era will be represented by a custom bus, a new space 3.0 by one of our standard ones. The customer for the mission is a 30-person startup based in US with $20 million in secured funding. They aim to build an 80-satellite Earth observation constellation, starting with a demonstration mission. For this purpose, we can fit their payload inside a standard 16-unit CubeSat bus and get it to orbit within seven months without sacrificing quality or cutting any corners during its test campaign. That's nine months faster than a custom bus, saving them $3.2 million in operational expenses throughout that period. But what if, as it often goes, the company realizes their constellation will require more capability from its satellite platform than they have originally intended, and they need to move up to a larger platform. Well, we're not here to announce just a single standard satellite bus. We've standardized our entire bus lineup. It's one of the broadest ranges of flight-proven buses in the market, split between four sizes of standard nanosatellites and three sizes of standard microsatellites, ranging from 10 to over 200 kilograms in wet mass. They all come with similar savings to your mission schedule and operational expenses, with lead times starting at seven months. But you might be wondering, what if your payload doesn't require a highly accurate AOCS system, like our Earth observation example? Well, there's one more thing. All seven of our standard buses come in three configurations, light, mid, and max, to match your mission requirements as closely as possible. But before you get overwhelmed by the number of options, don't worry. You can open our website right now, and our satellite bus configurator will have you covered. There, you can simply enter your payload requirements, such as mass, volume, pointing accuracy, your payload power demands, and it will automatically match the best standard satellite bus to your mission. From there on, you can view the estimated price, lead time, or download ICDs and CAD models to perform your payload fit checks. It's so simple, we don't even need to demo it. But you might be wondering now, how does standardization work in practice? Or how does it simplify satellite development? And to answer that, we'll need to put on our clean room suits and meet our Director of Product and Mission Development, Arnoldes. Welcome to one of our satellite rooms. Today, we're going to give a rundown on our standard satellite buses by using this example right here. So this is an MP42 satellite with the avionics bay right here and the payload bay right here. So this satellite is waiting for its final payload integration and test campaign. Once that is done, it's going to be a 120 kilogram satellite, which will be launched at the end of this year. There are three main ways how we can get to this stage. Option number one, we can use a standard satellite bus. So all you need to do here is go to our website and use the satellite configurator. You add your parameters there and it will output you a satellite configuration that will meet your mission needs in the most efficient way. Option number two is, let's imagine you download all the files and you see that the payload is a bit bigger than what we can give you in the standard satellite bus. It's not a problem. We can adapt all the necessary changes and non-recurring engineering to the platform itself, or we can consult you on what changes can be done to the payload, because sometimes it's much easier to adapt the changes to the payload rather than to the platform. And option number three is a fully custom satellite bus. So we do understand, as mentioned previously by Justas, that there is a need in the market for a tailored satellite bus, and we're not running away from that. If there's a need, we will tailor the bus specifically for need. But what is most important to understand that standard satellite buses allow you to avoid the lengthy process of design, such as mission analysis, structural analysis, thermal analysis, and in particular for MP42s, you do not need to have a structural module or qualification module which all in all, at the end of the day, allows you to save a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of stress, 
and makes your life much easier. So that's it for me. I need to clean this area for our engineers to finalize the AT campaign for this satellite right here. These 21 standard bus configurations didn't come out of thin cleanroom air. All of them are built on our extensive mission experience and flight heritage. We carefully looked at our satellite production pipeline and our flown remote sensing, communication, fundamental research and technology demonstration missions within the last 10 years. We found common denominators and designed our architectures around them. Do these standard configurations cover 100% of our customer missions? Not quite, but they do satisfy a substantial part of our past and current pipeline requirements. And just to be clear, we are fully aware there will still be a need for customization, which we are always glad to offer. But for New Space 3.0 to become like any other industry, such as automotive or consumer electronics, it needs to adopt standardization to deliver products at scale, drive down costs, timelines, and ensure quality, reliability, and availability. By standardizing our architectures, we increase our potential for automation in manufacturing, assembly, and testing. In addition, satellites in orbit can become even more akin to your smartphone, where frequent software updates introduce new features and improve performance. But before we step too far ahead of ourselves, standardization is already changing how we operate today. And no one can explain how standardization can help ensure mission project timelines better than our Director of Engineering Operations, Carlos. Here we are a few kilometers from our clean rooms where all of our PCBs are being manufactured. Over the past decade, Nanovionics has established a technological cluster enabling us to build satellites at scale. Up to 80% of our standard bus is vertically integrated. We design our product in-house and manufacture them close by, gaining tight control over our supply chain. The remaining subsystems come from our trusted US and European partners who meet our quality standards. The beauty of our standard satellite architectures from a supply chain and product assurance perspective is that they allow us to keep a stock of components to ensure accelerated satellite lead times, getting your precious payload to orbit quicker, at lower cost and at lower risk. So, historically speaking, New Space brought serial manufacturing to the space industry using commercial off-the-shelf components. But you might argue that more does not always equal better. And we would agree with it. A lot of New Space still continues to live on the promise of quantity over quality. We see this throughout the supply chain, where components and systems lack radiation testing other than total ionizing dose or claim specifications without any documented proof. And I've had a whole rant ready on this topic, but we're running short on time, so let's save it for an upcoming webinar. For now, I'll let our head of quality control, Arturas, talk about how New Space 3.0 could bridge the gap between the old space and new space practices. Carol has already mentioned some of the quality assurance measures we take to ensure high production quality of our hardware. But as we all know or eventually come to find out, space can find your weakest links in milliseconds, regardless of soldering standards. Over the past three years, we've invested significantly in advancing our radiation testing, component selection, par stress analysis, and reliability modeling efforts. And when it comes to radiation, total ionizing dose alone is not enough for new space 3.0. We can do better than that. All of our standard platforms benefit from the knowledge base we've built up by running countless heavy ion and single event effect campaigns to find the middle ground between old space and new space practices for radiation qualification. We've even upqualified some of the subsystems we outsource to meet our reliability requirements. Apart from radiation, the electronics in our standard buses meet ECSS standards for electromagnetic compatibility and must pass burn-in tests before satellite assembly. These and other quality assurance practices we're bringing to New Space 3.0 will benefit not only our commercial, but governmental and defense customers through improved satellite reliability and in-space availability. Having worked with several national security missions over the years, we have tailored our products and processes to meet their mission demands. However, bringing new space innovation to the defense domain also comes with certain security standards. As part of Kongsberg, a 200-year-young international technology powerhouse, 
that delivers world-class solutions, we are committed to providing robust and secure space services. But to translate these words into practice, we need a quick tour of the cosmos. So, welcome to Arsenala, the industrial complex of uh, Kongsberg. Here we are delivering some of the world-leading technologies for the last 200 years, ranging from deep sea to the surface, to the air, into the digital domain, and into space. And as promised by Justas, I will now take you to a tour uh, to the Cosmos uh, building. This is uh, one of the most modern space facilities in Northern Europe, and uh, particularly designed to also meet the strict requirements from our defense uh, customer. That also requires classified or sensitive payload work. So here we have our 1,200 square meters of uh, ISO 27000 certified clean room. And in a secure area like this, we have all the infrastructure needed to bring on the customer's classified or sensitive payloads onto our nano avionics satellite buses. In here, we also have the equipment to do all environmental tests for large constellation orders. We have an electrodynamic uh, shaker, multiple uh, environmental uh, stress screening, thermal vacuum chambers, bakeout chambers. With all of this, we have everything in place for us to perform the new Space 3.0, uh, where we can bring the innovation, security and facilities necessary to satisfy our national security customers. There is no doubt that the space industry will be transformed during this phase of New Space 3.0. We see the industry maturing, but we do not believe that standardization alone can help us all accelerate this process. As an industry, we need to become more transparent and upfront with our customers about what we can offer and provide them with the quality and timelines that foster innovation and ensure dependable operations in orbit. So, we want to keep this discussion going. If you come here today, you most likely received a ticket, just like this one. However, this is not our final destination. Another ticket should be arriving in your inbox right now to our follow-up webinar that will explore the bright future we can co-create together. This first webinar in a series will start with a panel discussion that covers everything you need to know about radiation testing and how new space should look at their component and supplier selection. And if you found your way here without a ticket in the first place, you can simply use a link in the chat to get one. We hope to see you next time in the era of new space 3.0.